in the, uh, we're, we're, we're toward the end of chapter one, and it's actually chapter one, verse 24, and we get now to day six of creation, and um, I'm just going to start reading, and we will pause and talk as we have been uh, up to this point. So, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. So we see there that the land animals have three categories. Um, you've got the, God begins with the livestock, be, I think because they'll be the most useful to man. So that would be anything, basically uh, cows and sheep and, and, and so forth. Um, and then uh, creatures that move along the ground, which are the creepy crawlies and, and other things, but the bugs, and what else? Um, lizards, I suppose. What else, what else moves along the ground? Um, Nightcrawlers? <laughs> sure, worms. The, the things that are under the ground, the grubs and things like that, anything you dig for to use as bait, right? Yep. And, then, uh, and then lizards and, yeah, and, um, and those other smaller um, icky animals. And then the, cre and then the wild animals, the, finally, the final one, uh, each according to its kind, and it was so. And I'm just going to mention here that in chapter 3, God has categorized here already that the snake, the serpent, will be a wild animal, not a crawling animal, according to chapter 3, verse 1. The serpent is the wisest of all of the wild animals, is the way God puts it. And I'm going to make a point about that when we get to the fall and so forth. All right. Next, the second verse of our, of our, of our day, day was six. There, was there like sacred animals that, like, or would they all just be considered? Do you, if you mean clean and unclean? Um, we, uh, um, certainly right after the fall, there are clean animals already. Um, because when Abel sacrifices, he brings clean animals that are sheep or her, something from the flocks and so forth. And Noah, who, you know, is not that many generations away, will understand what's meant by clean and unclean animals. So if whether there was something inherently um, in, in, the, in the conscience or something that a person would understand that this is okay, this is not okay. Um, however, man did not have animals to eat yet. So the sense of why they're clean and unclean isn't, isn't as distinctive. But what would be useful, I guess, would be more, the, more what they're thinking of, more than what is you know, okay to eat. So what would there be, for example, in certain fish that would be useful for man to use if he's not going to eat it? You know, there, there might be some things, and I'm thinking of, especially in, in certain fish, there might be oils or something like that that would be um, potentially useful. Um, uh, fish would not be as useful for for most things that you would think of. Um, and, 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 and something that is also maybe hard for us to understand is that God commanded his people to use the hide of an unclean animal in the tabernacle. So they used the hides of these things called sea cows or dugongs, which for us would be like a manatee or something along those lines. These, these, um, saltwater mammals that live in the shallows. And they're the biggest, nicest, gentlest creatures. Mm -hmm. And God used their hides as the rain covering mm -hmm. for, the, for the tabernacle. And so how, come, how can you, why, why do you get to do that if, you, if it's an unclean animal? Because um, as far as I know, a dugong might chew the cud, but doesn't have a split hoof. And that's the, that's, that's the whole thing with, uh, with those kind of, God doesn't say, what does it breathe? You know, although a manatee or a dugong is a mammal and does breathe air, and I, I don't think that they have technically a split hoof, but rather have some kind of a, of a fin 
or 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 a or a or a, or a paw. Yeah. I don't know how you would describe it. Um, I don't think that there's a claw there, but um, anyhow. Uh, so would they use things that are unclean for everyday purposes? And I I would have thought that Adam and Eve, in particular, before the flood would fall, rather would not. You know, but that's a really good question. So, and have I answered it? <laughs> okay. My answer is kind of, I'm not sure, but I wanted to explore, uh, you know, some different things there. Okay. All right. So verse 25, God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. So God did not, uh, for example, they're, they're, they, they do not evolve in this verse from a lower variety. They're all made according to their kinds right from the beginning. And there are three categories, and this is what they are. So we have, first of all, the wild animals. Those are, what What are these? Let's we'll see if you know your wild animals. Yana? Yana, very good. Fox. And do you know what these are? The livestock? Those are lambs or sheep. Very good. And the other one? Lizards. Lizards, yeah. <laughs> These are the biggest lizards, I think, in the world, unless, <coughs> unless crocodiles are bigger. But these are Komodo dragons. They don't classify a crocodile as a lizard. A crocodile is something else? I think that's what they're Okay. I think you're right. That's All I know is you don't want a Komodo dragon to bite you because you'll get infected, and that, that's how they kill you. So you, you, you run away from a Komodo dragon. Yeah. <laughs> and in a crocodile. Yeah. All right. Then God said, let us. So once again, we have a reference here to the Trinity with God referring to himself in the plural. Because otherwise, who else is he talking to? Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And there God lists all five categories of animal. And so man will have dominion over all the animals um, and, and, and whatever that would mean in the case of Adam and Eve. Um, and it, at this time, before they're using them for food purposes, but simply ruling them. And it might also have something to do with um, which ones are they going to use for useful purposes? And we were kind of getting into that, and I got off of it. But what would you use, for example, to make clothing? Of 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 most animals in the world, what would be the easiest and most logical thing to use? Cows. I think cows. Um, al anything almost the cows, but the, yeah. anything from the cow family or the deer family deer. would be would be large enough and useful enough, and buckskin or leather. You know, from from hides, would would make the the most sense to me. Sheep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. And uh, and goat skin, um, uh, especially the younger the goat, the better. Very pliable and soft and so forth. Um, and of course, what are the softest gloves? There's even a, a name for them that reflects that. Kid gloves is a reference to baby goats. Yeah, kid gloves. Uh, they're, they're really the softest, you know, most pliable. They don't get, they don't get tough, you know, and, uh, so, all right. So, and now we have maybe some poetry here. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So I don't know if Moses is maybe quoting a song here or if Adam had written this down or whatever, but it seems like it was a little bit of poetry. Um, and we're going to have a little bit more poetry uh, a little bit later. But we also have the word created that shows up here in the verse uh, three times. So another reference, perhaps, a hidden reference to the Trinity and the, and the work of God. God created, he created he created them, and so forth. Okay, God blessed them and said, 
Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. So all of the animals. And maybe another part of ruling would be to, um, if you want to, you can keep certain animals out of an area. You know, you can sort of sanctify an area. What's We, we still do it today. What, what do we use to sanctify an, an area, set it aside for a special purpose? Endangered animals. Oh, I'm thinking of the opposite way. Oh. How do I keep the deer out of my garden? <laughs> Offense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so th that, that, that could be too. That, and, and we're going to see, after, not only after the fall, but after the murder of Abel, that one of the things that Cain goes out and does is he builds a city. Why would you need to build a city? You know? And I think that the, the word there in that case, which is the Hebrew word ear, refers to not just that it's a, a large collection of buildings, but that it has fence. And then why do you need a fence? Well, he's been removed from the area around the Garden of Eden, which was God's paradise. And after the fall, animals are beginning to become predators. And why would Cain, who no longer lives, you know, in, in but he, 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 he's moved over to the land of Nod, you know, east of Eden. So where, what, what is it that's over there? And we were talking beforehand about maybe dinosaurs or other predators and maybe the, the reason for the fence, for the city. And I'm thinking in, in, in Cain's case, how would Cain build a, a wall around a city? I'm thinking of a palisade, which is if you've seen old pictures of Revolutionary War America, then you know what a palisade is because it's really just a log that's been sharpened on both ends. So one end you stick into the ground and the top end you sharpen to make it difficult to crawl over. But it's just a, just a line of logs that are tied together, you know, or maybe nailed, but probably just tied with rope or vine even to hold together. It's, you know, in, in, the, in the days after creation, we're talking about, can I say Gilligan's Island style <laughs> technology yeah. for a lot of their things. It might have been ingenious in some ways, but a lot of, just, you know, log upon log upon log kind of technology. I don't know when the ads or the axe were invented, but you need some specific tools to start building log cabins and things. And it meant more of more hut-like, I think, in the beginning. I don't think that's going to work for dinosaur, but okay. <laughs> well, well, the thing is, with, with many dinosaurs, some of them are visual acuity is the key. If they can't see you, you don't exist. Oh. It's not smell-based and so yes, forth. They don't see me. <laughs> so you know there is there is something. It's like a, it's like the reverse of the of the of the of the ostrich mm -hmm. legend. If they can't see you, they don't know that you're there. You know. And all, I've I've found that to be true of chocolate in my house. <laughs> if I can't see it, then for me it doesn't exist. You know, so the the, the more well hidden, the the better, I suppose. <laughs> I often forget about the candy drawer in my house, and it's it's been there for twenty twenty some years, and I forget that it even exists. I'm like, and I, I'll be doing dishes, and I'll think, well, you know, and I'll think, what's in this? Oh, it's a candy drawer, you know. You, the junk drawer, I know. I know where to find, you know, I, I, the duct tape and the screwdriver and thing and the batteries and stuff. That's but the, your priorities out there. My pri <laughs> <laughs> We'll just move on. But yes, my priorities are off. Okay. Then God said, I give you every, and this is, he, now he's talking to, he's, he's talking to Adam and Eve. But we haven't gotten to the, uh, the, 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 the um, expanded account of their creation. But he is talking to Adam and Eve here. So um, Moses does this all throughout, especially Genesis, but to a certain degree also Leviticus, where God will take a topic and at the end of a chapter, he'll give it to us like in a, in a, 
um, in, a, in, a, in a short, brief sentence. Then the next chapter is a, is a zoom in on that, or he expands on that. And so he, even though we haven't gotten the, the, the detailed story of the creation, this is where, of, of, of man, he's already talking to man here. It's not like there are two stories of the creation of Adam and Eve. It's just that Moses writes in this style where you get the short and then you get the long of the, of the same account. Okay? So God says, and this, this is to Adam and Eve, but only to Adam and Eve, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And therefore, obviously, can we all mention one if I go around the table? Can you name a seed-bearing fruit? Apples, oranges, oranges. Well, cherries. Cherries is good. Watermelon is not bad. I think that watermelon do not grow on trees, or I would be more scared. Um, but I, but actually, bananas have seeds in them. They're very soft and small. But if you cut a banana, you can see the lines of the seeds inside the banana. They're completely edible and everything, but they're. You don't, you don't usually see them on the outside. But you mentioned the pomegranate. You get pears and all that stuff are all. And I don't, I don't know, I, by the way, forgive me, I don't know what a date is. Is it a fruit? It's a fruit. It's a fruit? It's I know that it has a huge seed in it. Isn't it the prunes? prunes? Or it's a different? I think prunes and plums are, 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 are the same animal. Plum, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, dates are one of the main uh, products of certain palm trees. Some palm trees give coconuts, some palm trees give dates, they're called date palms, and banana trees are similar to palm trees, but they're a little bit different. And, uh, and, but, and of course, banana trees and coconut trees gets me back to Gilligan's Island. So let's get back to our, <laughs> let's get back to our text. So they'll be yours for food. And obviously, the creation of Adam and Eve is covered again and with greater detail in Genesis 2, but this suffices to place the creation of man in its place as the crown of creation on day 6. So God makes all of the animals, and then he makes man, that is Adam and Eve, on day 6, and then moves on to, again, what's going to happen with the animals for food. So to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, Everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. So green plants would include everything, including the seed-bearing fruit, right? Mm -hmm. So all of the, of the plants, so, which is why a lot of animals eat grasses and things like that and anything else along those lines. But there are other interesting exceptions, like this one. And this one, so that's, that's both a leopard and a, what was it, a turtle? Tortoise. Eating, a tortoise eating a watermelon. So, that's you know. That's an interesting picture. It is, isn't it? Well, they can eat both of them, actually. I'm just delighted that that's not my head. <laughs> and that it's a melon instead, different kind of melon. Well, th this isn't about the fall. God wanted them to, to fill the earth with sinless children. So that what, what's going to happen after the fall is it's going to repeat this command from God. It's same, same command. But this is the original one, which is in your sinless state, be fruitful and multiply. You know, you're a married couple. Have sex, have lots of babies. Fill the world with babies. You know, they, they had one job. Make babies. And... They were not able to begin before the fall, which suggests to me that the fall happened very quickly. You know, you have essentially two newlywed naked teenagers with one command, which is to make babies. I don't think that it lasted very long before the fall happened because you've got a discrepancy there in the way that nature normally takes its course. You have about a one-month leeway because it does take a while for a for a woman to get pregnant, but you've got but that's that's about it. I that that four weeks is about all I give them for the fall to have happened. 
Um, I'm not surprised that in ancient times, many, many <sighs> celibate priests and monks had no clue about such things. But I'm a dad. <laughs> I, you know, I understand how that stuff works. And, uh, and so it doesn't surprise me though that the ancient church struggled with this and really, really didn't have any idea of how long it, 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 it took before the fall happened. You know, I'm just going to say based on experience, not very long, you know. You know, you pointed out that I always thought that Adam and Eve said uh, adult, male and female, but, you know, I just never thought about it. Because probably, people, probably teenagers. Yeah, because Prob back then people get mm -hmm. married. Sure, yeah. Eve, I, I, I think of Eve as being, I don't know, 14, 15, 15 maybe, yeah. you know, and Adam about the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, they're certainly old enough to become parents, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of need for them to be more mature than that mm -hmm. physically mm -hmm. um, because there aren't any predators and, you know, that kind nor, of nor dangers. Sense. That kind of makes sense that they could mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That combined with the fact that, um, uh, is it 300 years later, Eve is still having babies? We'll get to that when we get to the, ge to the genealogy and how old was Eve when she had Seth. Mm -hmm. But she's still cranking out the babies for a long, long time. And I believe, I know, I'm sorry if I can say, I. Did you object to me saying cranking out the babies? No, no, oh, I just said that sounds exhausting. <laughs> I I suspect, and I, I have, I mean, I suspect that Eve, of all of the eggs that Eve was created with, because a woman has all of her eggs when she's born, I don't think that Eve wasted any of them. You know, be fruitful, increase in number, and I think that, you know, a woman has a baby, and then it's a while before she can get pregnant again, and she's not going to, half another egg come into the fertilization process for a while, but I believe that she didn't waste any, you know. So Eve may never have had a period the way that you poor ladies do, you know. It's possible. It's possible. All right, let's go on. Uh, I did all those, did these. And, okay, God saw all that he had made, and it was... Very good. Here God goes from saying tov, which is good, to tov ma'od. Very good. When he looks at everything. There was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So God is delighted with what he has made. It is flawless. It is perfect. Um, it is complete. And a verse from Isaiah 42. He who stretched, or rather created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. So um, this is a description of God who made everything and the different way he made everything. We see that the different verbs here, created, stretched out, spread out, you know, gives breath to. So all the different ways that God made everything, pulling this way, pulling that way, um, uh, giving breath to everything. And um, so I'm going to move on. So we have evening and morning. And I had this little brief thing about the angels um, that uh, we did have a question about it. Should we just briefly go into this now? We can visit it again later if we want to. Is that, that okay? So um, the I want to say this again. This is before I think you came in, Yoko, is that... Our, our Lutheran fathers, going back to the time of Luther, they never quote Ezekiel 28 with regard to the creation of the angels. And I, I don't think we need to rule... How, how can, yeah, that's, what I want to, that's how I want to say it. I don't think that we need to rule out Ezekiel 28 with regard to the creation of the angels. And I'm going to read to you from verse 12 onward in that, in that chapter. Um, and it goes like this. This is actually God's judgment on the king of Tyre. Tyre was um, at the top of the ladder of Tyre. So if you're going up the coast of Palestine and you started Egypt, 
and you start working your way up the coast, which goes like this, um, you hit a bump, and that's Mount Carmel. You're still in Israel. And north of Mount Carmel, then the, the, the land becomes like a stair step. When, when in, a, like in, in the interior of many countries, there are steps, S-T-E-P-P-E-S, steps, like in Russia or Scotland and so forth, and you, you're going uphill. Um, or like in, in, um, in the big island of Japan, you start going upwards all the time because you go up to Mount Fuji. What was, what was I told once? In, in Japan, a, uh, a man is wise if he climbs Mount Fuji once. And he is wise if he never does it again. Because <laughs> it's, cause it's a really, really long walk. Something like that. Anyway, um, as you're going up the ladder of Tyre, eventually you get, or you used to, get to this point, way up at the, at the height of this place, north of Israel. And there would be an island out, only about a mile out. So just, you know, kind of right over there. A mile in New Ulm is how many blocks? 12 blocks. That's not that far out, right? And there's this huge island, and it was a fortress with walls all around. That's the city of Tyre. And three different um, um, anchorages. So uh, tremendous. And in, in ancient times, it was just undefeatable until about, uh, oh, what was it? 230. 30 or whatever the year was, 250 or so BC. Alexander the Great came through and wanted to conquer the city of Tyre and they laughed at him and they mocked him and they said, you'll never get over here to, uh, to, to capture us. And so what did Alexander do? He captured another city on the mainland, which was like the supply city of Tyre, and he threw all of the rubble of the buildings he tore down into the ocean and he built a causeway which is this natural unnatural land bridge and by the way it's still there the the causeway built by alexander the great is still there today and leads leads out to tyre and then his army just was able to walk out and they conquered the city i'm kind of contracting everything but and it took a while it took like more than a year but it but that's how he did it um, well, in before the city was conquered, in the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel is living in the 500s. So three prophets were involved in the deportation to Babylon. Daniel went first. In the second deportation, uh, just a few years later, Ezekiel went. And in the final deportation to Babylon, Jeremiah was shackled up and ready to go. And then the commander, Nebuchadnezzar, came and said, oh, hi, Jeremiah, um, you don't have to go. And he unhooked him. And he said, you don't have to go. And so he didn't go to, he didn't go to Babylon. He told the people they should, and he was ready to go, but then he was told you don't have to. Um, and he was actually kidnapped and taken to Egypt instead. That's a different story. Um, but Ezekiel, going in the second deportation, is, then begins to have visions in Babylon beginning on his 30th birthday, about God's people and about what's happening. And Ezekiel sends um, judgments on the nations, as the major prophets often do. Isaiah does, Jeremiah does, Zephaniah does, and others, Amos does, and so forth. These judgments on the nations. And this is part of Ezekiel's judgment on the city of Tyre. Okay, just north of Lebanon, they were involved in that whole cedar log trade that helped to build the temple and so forth. Well, they also turned on God's people. And this is what he says to the king of Tyre. And it seems to have a double application. So I'm just going to read it and you can kind of absorb it, okay? You are the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. That is, those precious stones. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. 
You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you and I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Who does it sound like God is talking to? The devil. It sure sounds like that to me. Like God is, is combining the condemnation of the king of Tyre. You were wealthy, you were super rich, and you were doing okay. Maybe there was even a, a remnant of the true worship of God there. And then you got so rich, you let it go, and you became perverse in your worship and so forth. But at the same time, there are very specific things, like the use of the word guardian cherub. You know, a, a cherub is one of the fiery angels that, that, that serves God and, the, and, and so forth. And it sure seems to me like this is uh, an application of the, of the condemnation of the devil. And therefore, because he talks about the, the fiery stones that were brought forth, on the day you were created, to me that suggests the third day of creation as to when the devil and therefore the other angels would have been made. So that's why I come up with day three of creation for, for the creation of the angels perhaps. But I, I'm really, I really want, to un, want everybody to understand that I'm saying perhaps uh, because we don't know for sure when the angels were created but this seems like a pretty good, um, pretty good guess based on the text. But I also want to point out, and I, I, I started with this, so I'll end with it. Our Lutheran fathers, going back more than 500 years now, never cite Ezekiel, um, uh, what was this, 28? When they talk about the, the creation of the angels or of anything to do with the devil. So partly because it's, I think, in the context of the condemnation of an earthly king. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.